fare for the words that we have been singing and how they point towards the God that we need right now, the way maker, the miracle worker, the light in the darkness. Lord, we are living in a chaotic landscape at the minute, politically, socially. It feels like the entire world is spiraling, not knowing what's coming next, not knowing the way out. But Lord, we know the way maker. We know, Lord, that you have never relinquished your sovereignty over this world. You have never relinquished your love and care over this world. You have a plan. You have a purpose. You have a destiny for your church to bring your gospel to the whole world. Your plan of salvation is still ongoing. That hasn't been derailed. You are the way maker. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn once again to Luke chapter 15. If you've got your communion stuff, we'll share right after this message. We're continuing to look at these three parables that Jesus told, and in particular, we're focusing at the minute on, on the last one, the prodigal son. And one of the main themes that runs through all of these three parables is, is the misery of being lost, which is followed by the joyfulness of the restoration of being found. And over the last few weeks, I've been making us look at the misery of being lost. We've been looking at what lostness means to us. We've been looking at, at what the lostness of what the lostness meant to the lost sheep, to the lost coin, to the lost son. Last week, we looked at the enslaving nature of sin and how it wants to draw us away from God. And, and some of that stuff, admittedly, can be quite heavy, especially when you do it a few weeks in a row. But we're going to start turning a corner now, and we're going to start looking at what it means to be found, which is a much lighter subject, if you ask me. So once more, let's read together from the prodigal son, Luke 15, and we'll start at verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's servants have good food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me now like one of your higher servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring in his finger and sandals in his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. So they began to celebrate. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word to us, God. We thank you that in Scripture there is always a happy ending. This story ends with a happy ending of, of reunion and rejoicing. And Lord, we thank you that that is the merit, meta-narrative of your word, God. We know the end of the book. We know that at the end, we will be united with you, and we will be rejoicing and celebrating. Father, I just pray that you open each of our hearts this morning, God. Individually and personally, speak to each of us and tell us what we need to hear. By the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. The prodigal son is, is a parable that is full of drama, isn't it? It's full of drama, it's full of tension, full of emotion. And, and like a lot of these famous parables, we can sometimes get to a point where, where, where we know them so well. You know, we've heard that a dozen times, and sometimes when you've heard something a dozen times, you don't always get that sense of emotion from it anymore because, because you know exactly what's coming. And sometimes we can become so familiar with the elements of a story that we, that we don't even really think about them anymore. We just sort of... Quite often, the bits of the Bible that we know the best, we actually know the least because we just gloss over them because we know it. We, we know what we're expecting to read and we just gloss over. And sometimes we miss things which we don't even realise are there. And, um, and one of the things that I've noticed about this parable that, that we tend to overlook, that I overlooked for a long, long time, is that nowhere in this story do we hear the father speaking to the prodigal son. We see the son speak to the dad quite a bit at the beginning and the end, and we see the dad speak to other characters, but nowhere do we actually see the dad saying anything to his boy. Which seems odd, doesn't it? That's odd. Because this is a story which essentially is all about those two reuniting. It's all building up to this, this meeting that they have. And, and because it's so full of tension, so full of emotion, you would think that there would be something of a conversation between them. But we don't hear the father say anything. Instead, what we see the father do is he chooses to communicate to the son by the giving of gifts. The son says to him, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father then speaks, not to his son, but to the servants. And he says, quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring in his finger and sandals in his feet. Bring the fat calf and kill it so that we can feast. The father chooses to respond to his son's confession of guilt with the giving of gifts. And I believe that these aren't just any ordinary gifts. I believe that like the three gifts that the wise men brought to the baby Jesus... These, these are just dripping with symbolism. And to get a full picture of what the father is saying to his son through these gifts, and in turn to get a full picture of what God is saying about us when we return to him, because that is what this is a picture of, we need to understand what these gifts are trying to represent. And, and this week I want us to focus on that. I want us to focus on the first gift that was given the robe, or as you might call it, the robe of restoration. The first thing we hear the Father say in this entire parable is, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And, and there are a few things that this would have meant for the Son, there are a few things that this would have said to him and said about him to other people and and perhaps we'll look at some more of these aspects as the week goes on. But for now, there's just one thing I want to say. One thing. And that, that is that this robe would have covered them. Obviously. Because that's what clothes do, don't they? They cover. Oh, as Tilly's sitting there right now with her massive, her massive... Um, tapestry that she's pulled off a castle wall somewhere. Her massive robe, it covers us. We all wear clothes, don't we, to, to cover us. But while the robe that was given to the son wouldn't have been given to him to cover his nakedness, it was given to him to cover his dirtiness. Let me explain. Explain. Remember, when the prodigal son left home, he left with his inheritance. Almost arrogantly, he swaggers away from his father's house 
from his murder for the brother for the servants with with a bit of cash in his head. He, he's got a bit of capital, he's got a bit of resource, and, and he's got these dreams of his own making of what his life is going to look like. He's going to go out and do things his way now. And in his mind's eye, he's the man. He's the man. He, he's young. He's got money. He's going to do what he's going to do. And nobody's in charge of him anymore. But since that day, he's spent all his money, and now he's got nothing. He's been reduced to working in a pigsty, and he's been living through a famine so severe that he has even been tempted to eat the food that the pigs eat. But the famine was so severe that none of the pigs' food was even wasted on I would wager that at this point, the son who is now returning home probably looks a little bit more dishevelled than the day that he left. He's coming home penniless, he's coming home half-starved, and he's coming home after spending most of his days out among the pigs, and that kind of stuff, after a while, starts to show on a person. Sometimes you can just look at somebody and think, man, You've had a hard life, haven't you? You've had it rough. So before anything else, before anyone else sees him, before his mother comes out and meets him, before the brother gets news that he's home, the father who saw him coming from a far way off, who has ran out to meet him at a distance, says, quickly, bring the best robe and put it around him. And as this robe was placed on his shoulders something of the pig-stained, half-starved pauper that he's become disappears a little. And something of the sonship that he used to enjoy was given back to him. Something of the disgrace and the shame that he's returning home in is being covered by his father's act of love here. And as I was preparing this, it, it's hard for me to, to, to think about this and, and not also think about Adam and Eve. Remember when Adam and Eve first sinned against God, it says that they realised that they were naked and felt ashamed. So they hid. There was a sin that separated them from God, but it was their shame that made them hide from. So what did the Lord God do? He made garments and he covered them up. When God saw that his children were ashamed of their nakedness, he made garments to cover their nakedness so that they wouldn't be ashamed. The sin issue got dealt with thousands of years later. But the shame issue, God dealt with that straight away. And what was it he used to cover them? Well, don't tell the Sunday school kids that it wasn't fig leaves. Genesis 3.21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. It was skin, which means that something had to die in order to make these garments. I wonder if Adam and Eve saw it. I wonder, I wonder if they sat there and actually watched as God went out amongst the animals to pick one. To pick an animal that he created, that he loved, that he had given to Adam to care for so that he could then kill it so that he could make a covering, so he could take its life, so that they could have something of theirs given back to them. I wonder if Adam and Eve sat there and witnessed the immediate <coughs> cost of their sin and their shame. And it's hard for me to think about this story in Adam and Eve without thinking about the cross. 
when 2,000 years ago God accepted another life as a sacrifice for sin 2,000 years ago on a hill outside Jerusalem Jesus Christ died on a cross so that we might receive forgiveness Jesus took upon himself our guilt and bore the punishment that we all deserve so that we could be made right with God so that we could now be covered and when we look at the prodigal son's father, we see, a, we see a foreshadowing of this grace that was to come. We see a picture in this parable of what God was going to do to us when we would repent and come to him. You know, the father didn't have to give him this robe. Didn't have to cover him. He could have, he could have marched him back to the house. He could have paraded him. In, in front of the servants, in front of the mum and the brother, and just says, look at him. Look at the fool who dishonoured his father and mother. Look where his sin and his insolence and his arrogance has brought him. Look how far he's fallen since he decided to wrong me. But he didn't. Because he loved them. God didn't have to give Adam and Eve clothes to cover their shame. He could have said, good. You should be ashamed. You've broke the world. You've broke humanity. You should be ashamed of that. God didn't say that. Because he loved them. And Jesus Christ didn't have to die on the cross so that you and I might be exonerated by his death but he did because he loves us and he doesn't want his people whom he loves to live in shame you see sin <clears throat> separates us from God but it's shame that causes us to hide from him it's often shame that stops us from making that walk home. Because there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is guilt is just a fact. Guilt is a reality. You you guilt is a consequence of doing something wrong. You're either guilty or you're innocent. It's just the way it is. But shame, shame is a much more sticky problem, isn't it? Shame, shame has got nothing to do with the way things are. Shame is all about how you see yourself. A lot of people in this world who are, who are guilty of sin, who have done horrendous things, and they, they don't feel at all ashamed about it. And there's lots of people who have been, been, been declared innocent and free by the blood of Jesus Christ, yet they live in shame. Shame is about the way we see ourselves, whether we're guilty or innocent. But the beauty of it is that whether it's guilt or shame, God wants to deal with both of them. God has come to deal with both of them. And as we share communion together now, ask the Holy Spirit just where you are. Ask Him to reveal to you the areas of your life where you have been living in shame. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your mind's eye, to bring to your mind right now those parts that you sometimes work hard at keeping him away from, those parts that you don't really like to open up in front of him. And ask him to give you a revelation of the covering and the cleansing that has been won for you in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus Christ is the robe that our Father wants to put around your shoulders. Amen. Take a moment and just invite the Holy Spirit to open your heart, to open your imagination open the locked doors that we try and keep sealed. Let him 
draw your attention to the parts of your life that, that you still struggle to believe you're forgiven for. The parts of your life that you still feel the stickiness of shame, the parts of your life that you just think, man, if people knew about this, the Holy Spirit would want to change the way you see yourself today. If you have accepted the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers, if you've been born again and washed in his blood, then you are forgiven. You have been declared innocent. You are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yet despite all that, we can still live in shame. But that shame doesn't come from God. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you open the door to the parts of your life that you like to keep locked. As we share these end ones together, ask Him for a revelation, for a work of the heart, for a breakthrough moment to reveal to you the forgiveness, the cleansing, the covering, the freedom that has been made a reality through the cross of Christ. body of Jesus Christ that was broken for you in the cross so that you would be made right with God. And the blood of Jesus Christ that was pulled out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Just take a moment. Just gonna ask Pete to come and play his guitar a little bit as we sit and allow the Holy Spirit to do his good work. Romans 8 says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. We pray the Holy Spirit makes that a reality in our hearts and souls this morning.